Uh, my name is Andrew Durand and I work at Google Sydney and on the Go team, the Go programming language. Just before I get started, who here um, has heard of Go before? And keep your hand up if you've actually seen some Go code. What if you've written some Go code? My colleague there is feverishly waving his hand. Cool. Um, and other languages that you guys use, who's, who writes Java code typically? And Python? JavaScript? Anything else? Just yell something out. Scala. Scala? Cool. Common Lisp. Common We've got one real nerd here. That's all right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so in this talk today called Real World Go, I'm going to introduce Go, talk about some of Go's um, interesting language features, and also discuss some real world applications in which Go is being used outside of Google. And we do use it uh, increasingly extensively within Google. Um, but there's a lot of interesting projects happening out there in the wild as well. Um, there is a system called Speaker Meter, which we're using at Bootcamp and I.O. to get feedback from people. Um, that's a QR code you can scan now, but I'm going to take it off the screen probably before you'll get a chance to do so. Um, I'll show it again at the end. It's just a good way of getting feedback back to me so I can improve uh, my speaking skills. So I'll just start with some background as to the origins of Go, um, the why and what. So why Go? It's a question I get asked pretty often. Uh, why create a new programming language? We have so many. Um, surely there's not a need for another one. Um, well, it was born basically out of frustration with the existing languages, um, the, the, the mainstream languages that we had at our disposal. Um, the statically typed languages, um, the dominant ones like C++ and Java, tend to be uh, very efficient when they compile and run. Um, and they give you a lot of control, but they're typically very bureaucratic. Um, they can be very verbose in use, um, but, and also overly complex. It can be difficult to understand exactly how the code that you've written will behave um, when you've written it. And sometimes they can be very, very picky. But on the other hand, we have these dynamic languages and scripting languages that are really easy to use. Um, but because they're dynamically typed, um, they can be very error prone. A lot of programmer errors that would be compile errors in a statically typed language become runtime errors in a dynamic language. And this means that uh, you don't notice until you've deployed your program that some obscure corner case triggers a colossal bug. Um, they can also be inefficient and slow. And when you start writing code at scale, and particularly at a kind of Google scale with many tens of thousands of programmers, um, they, they really start to break down in terms of their ability to componentize and abstract things. And finally, we live in this uh, concurrent world where we have many, many networked machines and multi-core machines. Um, but the traditional approach to writing concurrent software is tricky. It involves threads and locks. And you have to be very precise in your reasoning about those programs to write correct concurrent <laughs> programs. Um, so generally, the landscape looked like you had speed, reliability, or simplicity. And you had to pick two. And sometimes you only got to pick one. Um, and we thought, well, can't we do better than this? So Go is a modern general purpose language. Um, it compiles to native machine code on a variety of architectures. Um, it's statically typed. Um, so you get the, the reliability and efficiency benefits of a statically typed language. But it has a lightweight syntax. Um, using type inference, we can uh, infer a lot of the type information, so you remove that repetition from defining types and such. Um, it has a simple type system. Um, it's not a classical OO kind of model, um, and so it's very easy to understand what's going on and understand what your code does. And finally, it has some novel concurrency primitives um, that make reasoning and writing, uh, reasoning about and writing concurrent code a lot more straightforward. So when we design Go. Uh, the tenets of that design were, first and foremost, simplicity. Um, each language feature should be easy to understand in and of itself. So you should be able to understand all the rules associated with a particular feature and make, um, e easily make valid decisions about how that should behave. And going hand in hand in that, there's orthogonality. Each of those features should, uh, when, when they interact with the other features, 
should interact in a predictable and consistent way, a way that's easy to understand and reason about. And finally, readability. That's very important when working in a collaborative environment that when you look at a piece of code, you should be able to understand what that code does without having to have a huge amount of external context in your mind in order to make sense of it. And driving all of this was a consensus-driven uh, design process. Um, Rob said that nothing went into the Go language until Ken Thompson, Robert Griesmer, and Rob all agreed that it was right and it was correct. And as a result, there were some language features that, didn't, that were in discussion for over a year before they actually made it into the language proper. And each, each of those three has, a very diff, has very different aesthetics, very different opinions about languages. And so the, 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 in the end, the compromise is something that's really solid and very, very well thought through. So this is uh, 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 one of the simplest possible Go programs, just a hello world. Um, it has a package statement saying which package the program belongs to. E every Go program starts in package main with function main. We have an import statement. The fumped package is a string formatting package. And our main function simply calls the print line function from the string formatting package to print um, hello world. And that, I think those are the Chinese characters for world. That just un the, we use those characters to underscore that all Go source files are UTF-8, um, Unicode files. So you can use um, Unicode in string literals. And you can also use them in identifiers. Um, so if you are writing a mathematical formula, for example, you can use like a sigma character to signify um, some value, if you like. Um, and this is Hello World 2.0. So if you run this program, it starts a web server listening on port 8080. And if you visited that URL, uh, you would see um, the string Hello World. Um, the difference between this and the previous slide is we've added the HTTP package to the imports. And now we've defined a second function, handler, um, which is an HTTP handler that simply writes the string Hello followed by the path component of the URL um, as the HTTP response. And, this, and in the main function, we register that handler to the web root and start the web server. So this is just to give an idea of um, the sort of succinctness of Go code, how straightforward it is to accomplish something that's actually um, quite complex under the hood. So let's take a look at Go's type system. So I mentioned Go is a statically typed language, um, but the type inference system that we have saves a lot of repetition. Now, this is a bit of a contrived example for Java, but um, in Java and C or C++, um, you need to say which, which type your variable is going to be, and then you assign something of that type to the variable. And so in Java's case, you say integer i equals new integer, or foo equals new foo. Um, in C++, C or C++, you have to say int i equals 1. But it's obvious in the code that most of the time you just want an integer. So in Go, we can just say i colon equals 1 to declare a new i, which is an integer equal to, equal to 1. If we use a floating point initializer, then it'll be a float64 type. Um, and if we use a string, it'll be a string. And in this final example, I've actually created a function value, um, mul, which multiplies two integers and returns an integer. And the, the type will be inferred to be a function type that takes two integers and returns an integer. So this gives you an idea of the kind of shorthand that you start to develop writing Go code. Um, in Go, we, have me we define methods on types. And methods can be defined on any user-defined type. Um, in this case, I've defined a type called point, which is a struct containing two values, x and y, both floats. And then I can declare this method abs on, on point, And it returns a float64. And all that does is return the absolute value of that point. Um, and then to, to create a point value, I just say p colon equals point with some initial values. And then I can take the app, call apps on that p in the same way you would in Java or other languages like that. So it's kind of familiar. But when I say they can be defined on any type, I mean like any type. Uh, it doesn't have to be a struct. A struct kind of looks like an object. But this kind of underscores here, if I have my float, um, which is just a float64, I can define uh, an abs method on, on that type. And uh, it just returns the absolute value of that floating point value. And then I can create a my float in the same way I did with point and call abs on that. So what I'm trying to show here is that Go objects are just values. Um, there's no sort of box. There's, it's not a, it doesn't have to be a class. You just define methods on bits of data. And so it's a nice way of associating logic with, with data, but without this sort of the weighty overhead of, uh, 
of establishing a class and building that kind of hierarchy. So in order to generalize Go types, in order to make them interact nicely with each other, we have um, Go's concept of interfaces. And interfaces simply specify the behaviors of types. So you def when you define an interface type, you define a set of methods. And often it's just one or two methods. I think the largest Go interface I've seen has maybe four or five. Um, and uh, any type that implements those methods will implement that interface implicitly. So if I have some function print abs, which takes an absa, which is any type that implements abs, I can pass in a value of type my float or a point to that function. And uh, at no point did those, either of those types have to be aware of the absa interface. They don't have to declare that they implement the absa interface. They just do simply because they declare the abs method. And this, to give you a concrete example of this, in the I.O. package in the standard library, um, we declare an uh, interface type called writer. And writers are used to write streams of binary data to things. And they, it's just one method called write, which takes a buffer or a slice of bytes or an array of bytes and returns the number of bytes written and an error value. But there are many, many writers throughout the standard library and in other Go code. And then you can use those writers anywhere where a writer is expected. And we've already seen an example of this. Um, in the Hello World 2.0 example, in our HTTP handler, we have an fprint statement. And fprint writes the string to w. w is a response writer. It's our HTTP response. And the reason why this works is because fprint expects an IO writer. And HTTP response writer implements the right method. Now, at no point does the, the fumped package need to be aware of the HTTP package. It just works because that interface is implemented implicitly. And there's examples of this everywhere. I mean, you can just as easily, uh, um, say, encode an image to a writer, or you can, uh, in internally in the HTTP handler, we have like, if, you, if you're writing a gzipped HTTP request, you can just chain these writers to write from, from this response writer to a gzip writer to the network connection itself that sends the, the response to the user. So this becomes very, very powerful um, once you're, you're coding at scale. And it really Im uh, helps to uh, decouple pieces of code and make them independent of each other and very easy to mix and match. And now a bit about Go's concurrency features. Who is familiar with Unix environments? It's, it's the world, isn't it? Um, in Unix, we think about processes that are connected by pipes. Um, if I wanted to find all of the, uh, the number of lines of test code in the Go standard library, I could issue a find to find all the file names in the Go package tree, um, grep them for files ending in test, and then pipe that into a word count and, and get the, uh, the number of lines. Each of these tools is a simple tool um, designed to do one thing and to do it well. I mean, this is, this is the Unix philosophy, right? And so we have a standard interface um, between each of those, um, and, and then they can just be connected indiscriminately. The analog in Go is that uh, you have Go routines that are connected by channels. So what's a Go routine? A Go routine is like a thread. Um, they share memory like a, like a typical threading environment, but they're much cheaper than threads. Um, Go routines have segmented stacks, which means that they can be created in only a few kilobytes. So they're very, very cheap to create and destroy. And uh, the Go runtime typically schedules many of these Go routines across uh, a fewer number of operating system threads, often only a handful. It's possible to have thousands or tens of thousands of Go routines running in a program that is essentially single-threaded. So the syntax to launch a Go, a Go routine is using the go keyword. If I had some function sort that takes a list and sorts it, um, I could choose a, a pivot i and then uh, sort uh, each part of that list in separate go routines by saying go sort, which calls the, the sort function in a new go routine. The other part of Go's concurrency model are channels. Um, channels are a typed conduit for synchronization and communication. So a channel can send or receive any Go type. So unlike Unix pipes, which are simply um, binary data, 
channels are, are typed. And the way you use a channel is with the channel operator, which is a less than dash, it looks like an arrow, and you use that to send and receive values through a channel. Um, and the, the data moves in the direction of the, of the arrow. So in this compute function here, um, compute takes a, a channel of integers called ch, and then it will call the function sum computation and send the result of that function to the channel ch. And then in the main function, we can create the, a channel of integers using the make function, store that in ch, launch a go routine that calls compute. And so compute will go off and run this function send the resulting value on ch. Meanwhile, in my main function, in the main go routine, I receive a value from that channel and store it in result. And then later I can do something with that result. So to give a better example of synchronization, um, let's look back at the sort example. I had these two go routines that have gone off and are sorting this list, each take a part of the list to sort. But then how do I know when they're finished? I can use a channel to synchronize those go routines um, so that I can find out when they're both finished and therefore when the list is sorted. So in this example, I create a channel done, which is just a channel of Boolean values. It could be a channel of any kind of values. What I'm interested in is the message that something has happened, not the value itself. And then I create a do sort uh, closure. So Go has um, closures. It encloses the, the done channel. And do sort takes a, uh, a slice, S, sorts that slice, and when it's finished, it just sends the value true to that channel. It could be false, it doesn't matter what the value actually is. And then back in the, in the main Go routine, I choose the pivot and actually launch uh, two new Go routines that do that sort. And then after they're done, I just receive two values from the done channel. After I've received both those values, I know that both those sort operations have completed, and so I can continue on with the code. Um, and this works because unbuffered channel operations are synchronous. Um, they only happen when the sending side and the receiving side are both ready um, to, to make the operation happen. So a slightly more concrete example of communication. Um, in a typical sort of threading model, you might have many workers that feed from a task pool. And um, in a traditional sense, you would have worker threads contending over some lock for a pool of work. And so it um, doesn't matter if you don't really understand what this code means precisely. But basically, we have this pool which has a, a mutex in it and a, a list of tasks. And then if I have some worker function, and if many of those are running concurrently, if they want to get a new piece of work, they have to take that lock, they have to pick the next task out of the pool, and then they have to adjust the pool's length and then un release the lock, and then they can process the task. So already my function is, is, my worker function is more concerned with uh, dealing with the concurrency model than it is in actually doing the work, which is, we think is the wrong way to think about it. In Go, a, a more idiomatic way to do this in Go would be to have many worker Go routines that just receive tasks from a channel and then they send the tasks to another channel when they're done. So in this case, I have a worker function um, many of which will be running in separate, their own Go routines. And then uh, they just loop forever, receiving work from an in channel and processing it, and then sending work to an out channel. And so in my main function, um, I create two channels, pending and done. Um, and then I launch some Go routine to create work somewhere, and that, they will just send work on the pending channel. And then I launch 10 workers to receive work from the pending channel, work on it, and send it to done. And then I launch a function consume work to just consume the work that's, that's actually been completed. Um, and so in this sense, all we're looking at here is, is uh, the only code on this screen is code that's actually concerned with doing what we want to do. We don't have to think about locks. We don't have to think about um, contention or anything like that. It's, it's simply the code required to express the problem. And that's the real, real elegance of the system. So Go routines, they give you the efficiency um, of an asynchronous model, of like an event-driven model, um, except you can write code in a synchronous style. You just write Go routines um, to do their specific jobs well, um, to think about their specific problem, and then you connect them together with channels. And in practice, this yields uh, much, much simpler code and much more maintainable code because it's a lot easier to reason about a, a single Go routine or a single function 
which has a specific job to do. Um, and so Go encourage you to think, encourages you to think about the concurrency, uh, the concurrency issues that actually matter. And our sort of mantra is, don't communicate by sharing memory. Instead, you can share memory by communicating about that memory. Um, another really nice thing about Go is it has quite a rich standard library. Um, and it's very carefully constructed and consistent. Um, and so we have more than 150 packages in the standard library. And it's constantly under development. It's practically improving every day, um, literally improving probably every couple of days. There's a huge amount of progress being made in this regard, which is great. And beyond the standard library, we also have um, more than 200 packages uh, listed on our package dashboard um, with like MySQL, MongoDB, other database drivers, SDL bindings for doing graphics and audio, um, protocol buffers for communicating um, across networks, and um, OAuth libraries for uh, interacting with, with foreign systems and APIs. And I'll just quickly give you a glance at the, uh, the Go standard library. So this is a list of standard library. We've got archivers, um, compression, crypto. There's a lot of crypto, actually. Um, encodings, um, X11, um, packages for reading Go code, HTTP, and so on and so on. And this is the um, package dashboard, which lists um, recent installs of packages, uh, Go packages written by third parties. And so you can see there's a huge amount of activity going on there. So it's very much a, a, an ecosystem that's thriving and alive and well. So now for the sort of second part, um, what, what is Go actually good for? Well, when we launched Go, we called it a systems language, which was probably a bit misleading. Um, we, we originally thought it would, be the, a, it would be a good replacement language for the kind of things we were using C++ and Java for at Google. But it turned out that there was a lot of interest from people in the dynamic languages camps. There were a lot of people frustrated by um, the scripting languages they were using, and they were enticed by an easy to use, um, reliable language that performs well. Um, and so we've seen a lot of diverse uses of Go um, from around the world in scientific computing, web applications, graphics, um, network tools, and, and much more, more than I can enumerate here. And so now we just call Go a general purpose language. So let's look at our real world examples. The first example um, I want to look at is Heroku. Who's heard of Heroku? Anyone? They're a, a, uh, a cloud hosting company for Ruby programmers. And um, two guys there, Keith and Blake, were designing a distributed init system um, for their, for their um, cluster of, of virtual machines. And they needed to manage processes across this big fleet in a way that could recover gracefully from instance failures, network partitions, and so on. And so they need a way to reliably synchronize and share information among those servers in a way that is consistent. And so they wrote something called Doza. Um, so Doza is a basis for building distributed systems. It's a highly available, consistent data store. And what it does is it provides a single fundamental synchronization primitive called compare and set which can be used as the basis for building any kind of synchronization operation. And indeed, in Go's memory model, we use compare and set internally to implement that. But this is compare and set over a network. Um, and so it can be used for a whole range of things. Um, they say that Doozer is where you put the family jewels. And um, one typical example of a system like this is in, in database master election. So imagine you have. Um, a, a master and master, database master and several slaves. If the master goes away and just disappears, what do the slaves do? Th they can use Doza to, uh, to decide who gets to be the next master. Or similarly, uh, if you have, say, a cluster environment which is high performance and needs to be readily available, you can use Doza as a name service. You could use DNS, but then there's propagation delays and other issues associated with that. Using Doozer instead, you can just push all of your name information into there. And then you know that every node in your network is seeing the same information at the same time in a way that is available and consistent. And the same goes for configuration. They push all of their configuration data into Doozer. And, uh, and that means that all of the servers know the state of the system simultaneously. They know what they're supposed to be doing. And it, they can rely on that to be true. So why did they choose Go to do this? Well. First and foremost, Go's concurrency primitives suit the problem. Um, Doozer uses a, a protocol called Paxos to achieve the consensus between nodes. 
And Paxos is a very, very complicated distributed algorithm that is described uh, in terms of separate entities that communicate th by sending messages asynchronously. And it's very, very hard to get this right. Um, there are a lot of implementations out there, and many of the example implementations used to educate people about Paxos are full of errors. Um, but they found that Go routines and channels actually made it manageable or, e or even easy um, to implement Paxos, although that's probably too strong a word. It's still hard. But they said that in, this is a quote from them on the Go blog that they wrote for us a couple of weeks ago. And they said that in the same way that garbage collectors improve upon malloc and free, we found that Go routines and channels improve upon the lock-based approach to concurrency. These tools let us avoid complex bookkeeping and stay focused on the problem at hand. We are still amazed at how few lines of code it took to achieve something renowned for being so difficult. So that's quite a testimonial. They also um, found Go convenient through its standard library. They were able to implement a web-based um, administration console for Doza in literally a train ride. Um, and so they, they said this is a real testament to how well Go mixes systems and applications programming. And finally, they said that uh, Go has a mechanical source formatter called GoFumpt, um, which is used to make all Go code look the same and settle any syntax disputes. And they found that they never argued over where to put a curly brace, tabs versus spaces, or if we should align assignments. Who's had a, an argument with a colleague about syntax issues? Seriously. I know I have, but I haven't since I've started writing Go code. Um, they just simply agreed that the buck stopped at the output of GoFund, which is great. My next example um, comes from New Zealand from a company called MR Office. And um, one man, Case Farkamp, um, had a background in market research software, but he found most of the existing software in that space to be pretty, pretty lacking. Um, so he launched his company, MR Office, in 2010 um, to make better software for this industry. And the flagship product he designed is called Dialer. And what it does is, um, in a call center environment, you have many interviewers who are cold calling people to perform interviews. And um, they have uh, interview software that provides scripts um, for those interviews and collects the statistics. And they have a VoIP gateway for actually making the telephony calls. But they needed some, uh, Dialer solves the problem of choosing numbers to call and calling them such that no interviewer is waiting for people to pick up and such that no interviewee is being kept on hold before an interviewer arrives. It's actually quite a difficult problem and one that he seems to have solved well. So originally he wrote Dialer in Python and he said, I love Python, he uses it for everything. But he found that long running server processes are not, it's not such a good choice for those. So there's a lot, he was getting lots of runtime errors that could have been caught during compile time. And he said, when Go came out, it would immediately made sense to me. It was type safe, compiled, and feels like a scripting language. So he ported his code base to Go. And it worked for him because he found that the concurrency model really suited the problem he was having. If you have a Go routine to handle each call, each interviewer and each interviewee, and Go routines to connect those together, you can then uh, they, and communicate together via channels. Um, it greatly simplified the problem. And he also found that the HTTP and WebSocket libraries made it really easy for him to just throw together a, uh, a management user interface. So he has this beta product now running in multiple call centers around the world. And he's also working on a predictive dialer design using neural networks and pushing the features even further. And his conclusions about Go is he found the tutorials and documentation were excellent. Um, and he said, I've been converted to statically typed languages, which I think is one of the nicest testimonials I've heard about Go. And he says that Go is a good compromise for cooperation between type purists and lazy scripters. And I think he was describing himself as a lazy scripter. Um, my next example is from a company called Atlassian. Um, Atlassian make uh, development collaboration tools for developers. Um, they're a worldwide company and they, mo they mostly uh, develop in Java. But they have this testing cluster of virtual machines which they use to test all of their software across. And they run on a large number of these diskless hosts. Um, and it has a provisioning and monitoring system that's written in Go. Um, and so that system consists of three parts. There's an agent um, that, uh, that runs on each virtual machine and it monitors the state of the virtual machine broadcasting that state across the LAN. A manager process that listens to those agents' broadcasts and then takes some action if the virtual machine fails um, to, to report. And a command line tool for issuing commands to the manager process. 
So the agent itself is trivial. It just sits there looping endlessly, uh, reading its state from the proc virtual file system, encoding that state in a protocol buffer and broadcasting it out across the network. And then the manager process, when it starts up, it reads a configuration file, launches a Go routine, one Go routine for each virtual machine in the cluster. And each of those Go routines just listens for those announcements from the agent. And uh, if it fails to, to check in, it will issue instructions, um, usually via shell commands, to keep that machine in the correct state. And so this is a kind of uh, diagram of, of, of how that works. You have physical machines, which each have VMs, which each have agents. And each of those agents corresponds to a Go routine running in a single manager process. So uh, he, he um, Dave Cheney, who wrote this, um, found it really easy to de deploy and ship binaries using Go, because Go binaries are all statically uh, linked and have no dependencies. And so he just uh, was able to push out these, these binaries to these diskless hosts, and he found it much easier um, compared to shipping a JVM or a Python runtime. And he also found that the, the one Go routine per virtual machine made the problem really easy to approach. And he said it was trivial in Go, um, but really painful in other languages that he tried. So my next example and final example is a system called Camly Store, which was written by Brad Fitzpatrick. Um, and he wanted to store his data across all of his devices and to share that data with his friends in the public. And it really is that general. He wanted to make a system for storing all data and sharing it with anyone. Um, and so at its core, Camly Store is a content addressable data store, which means that all content in the system is identified by a hash of its content. Um, it's a synchronization and access control mechanism for that data across data stores. It's an, AP, it's an application programming interface for uh, people that want to interact with the system. It has a user interface. It is considered your home directory for the web. And finally, it's programming language agnostic. It's not Go specific, um, except the largest parts of it are written in Go. So the use cases for Camly Store uh, say personal backups, which you can automatically synchronize um, to various cloud files, um, service, file hosting services or other, other systems in other places. As, or a Dropbox style file synchronization mechanism for synchronizing your uh, working data across machines. You can use it for photo management and sharing. There's an Android app so that if you take a photo, it can automatically get pushed out to your Camly store and shared with anybody who has access rights to your photos. And you can also use it for um, website content management. Um, so if you want to push objects into there and have them served out over HTTP, um, that will work as well. So the Go parts of Camly store are the Camly store daemon, um, which is the blob server in itself, the thing that stores all the data, um, an HTTP server for interacting with Camly store clients via the Camly store API. Um, a user interface for users and administrators, and, uh, and also some command line tools, um, camput and camget for interacting with the data store, camsync for synchronizing data stores, um, and probably the most interesting example is cammount, which is a fuse file system, like a, a user land file system, which you can use to access data directly from a Camly store blob server. Um, it also includes about two dozen assorted libraries, which he wrote in the process of building Camly Store. And each of those libraries is not just something that's tied inherently to Camly Store proper. It's something that um, they're, they're all little pieces that you can pull out and use in other pieces of software, and, and which he has done and others have done. Um, so why did he choose to write it in Go? Well, this is a kind of this is the nicest Go testimonial I've seen. Um, he said, I've been writing Go for over a year now, and it makes me giddy about programming again. Annoying things that are, aren't annoying. Trade-offs that I normally worry about, I no longer worry about. I bust out lots of fast, correct, maintainable, testable code in very small amounts of time. And he hasn't been this excited about a language in ages. Um, I asked him how long it took him to write cam mount, the fuse file system thing, and he, he just said, oh, two or three beers. Like, literally, it's, it's that productive a language. And um, we also asked, you know, why didn't you write Camly Store before? He said, well, I had the idea for a very long time, but it wasn't until I got familiar with Go that I felt that it was actually possible. It just always had seemed too painful um, before then. So in this presentation, I've shown um, four examples of Go being used in very different ways. 
Um, we have this, uh, a rock solid systems programming language in Doozer. Um, we have uh, Go being used for simple and reliable applications programming um, in Dialer. Uh, we've seen just simple utility programming utilizing Go's concurrency support um, at Atlassian. And with Camly Store, we've, see, we've seen a full stack programming happening uh, from data store to user interface. Um, Go has been more than capable at all of these things. So one thing I haven't mentioned so far is that Go is open source. Um, it, it began at Google in 2007 as a 20% project. Um, and was re but in November 2009, we released it under a BSD license. So it's totally free. Um, since its release, uh, over, uh, more than 130 non-Google contributors have submitted over 1,000 changes to the Go core. And so there's a huge community involvement in developing Go. Um, about 10 Go employees work on, Google employees work on Go full time. Um, and we have two non-Google committers. Those are people who can commit straight to the Go core and dozens of regular contributors, um, people who write code for us um, every week. So all Go development um, takes place on public mailing lists. All of our code reviews and all of that process is fully visible to the outside world. And I invite you now, if this kind of thing interests you, um, to get involved. Um, we're very open to new contributors. Um, we have a lot of documentation for getting started working with the Go Core, and we welcome anybody who wants to uh, contribute to our project. So I've only really scratched the surface about what Go is about here. Um, there is a lot more to it still, um, and you can learn a lot more about Go at I.O. today and tomorrow and the next day. Um, this afternoon I'm taking a workshop called Get Started with Go, which will be a hands-on uh, uh, getting started with, um, with the Go language. And I'm doing that twice. There's two sessions, one and a repeat. And uh, tomorrow, uh, Rob Pike and I will be giving a talk called Writing Web Apps in Go. Um, I strongly encourage you to come along to that. There'll be surprises, there will be cool swag. And um, at office hours uh, from 12 till 3 at IO on both days, you can meet uh, with some of the Go team and have all of your questions answered. And if you're interested in pursuing this further now, I strongly encourage you to visit our website or our official blog. There's a huge wealth of information there and, um, and a lot of articles and a lot of informative stuff to, to get you started. So does anybody have any questions? The question was, where is Go being used inside Google? Um, unfortunately, I can't answer that question, but I can say that it is being used uh, in a lot of places um, for a variety of purposes. But I can say that one place where it's seen a lot of adoption is in the operations kind of tasks where you have um, people who administer large systems who typically write, would write scripts to, to do things across a vast number of machines. They can now do this in Go and they find it a, lot more, a much more efficient language than what they'd been using before. Anything else? The question was, is anybody using Go for embedded programming and what's the state of the ARM compiler? I'm not, um, I'm not aware of anybody using it for um, embedded proper. I know a while ago somebody was, um, the guy who started the ARM port uh, over a year ago did so because he wanted to run it on uh, a, a small embedded device to drive one of those um, 3D milling machines. Um, so I know that's happened, but I haven't heard much about that since. But we've been, uh, the Go compiler is mature and it's stable and we track the build status of it and we run builders on the Nexus One phones. So it runs on, on where Android will run. Um, and it, it, you know, I can imagine it will be able to power Android applications at some point, but it's a matter of doing the heavy lifting involved in building the interfaces to do that. Um, but we're very, very committed to ARM as a platform. It's certainly not a second-class citizen. We've invested a huge amount of time in making our ARM compiler uh, really mature and the code generation really efficient. Yep. Why is there a, uh, what's the use of the distinction between the new and the make keywords? Um, the question was, what's the distinction between the new and make keywords? I don't think I showed new in this talk, but I may have. Yeah, so um, 
make is for initializing internal Go data structures like um, maps or slices or um, channels. And new is for initializing instances of user-defined types or, um, or built-in types. New just initializes, it, it allocates some memory and returns a pointer to that memory. And that's all it does. But make actually does something more than just allocating. The question is, are there common pitfalls for people starting from C++ or Java who get into Go? Um, the, the most common pitfall is um, people tend to bring with them a whole lot of uh, uh, patterns that they inherit from these sort of traditional object-oriented languages. And as I mentioned, Go doesn't have classes. Uh, it doesn't encourage you to use subtype inheritance. Um, there is something that's like inheritance, but it's, it's much less uh, far-reaching. Um, and really, I think the biggest hurdle is that people have to say, people often come to our mailing list and say, uh, you know, how do, how do I set up this particular type hierarchy? And, and the answer is, well, don't do that. Um, but the, the more polite answer is, well, what is the problem you're actually trying to solve? Like, uh, maybe if you, and so once we find that once people sort of describe the, the bigger picture of what they're trying to do, there tends to be a, a more elegant and idiomatic way of doing that in Go. So I think, you know, as with learning all new things, there's always a process of unlearning involved as well. And I think that's actually one of the things I've enjoyed the most about learning Go has been reevaluating a lot of the things that I'd considered a given um, about programming. Um, a lot of that stuff has actually turned out to be not very important at all. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, so, can you talk about when you would do So, uh, the question was, um, I showed some locks, locks in my code, and when would I choose to use explicit locking versus using channels? Um, so, basically, you just use whichever is easiest, um, whichever is clearest. Sometimes, um, using a lock is, is the most elegant way to express a particular um, thing. The classical example in Go is when you have some shared data structure that you want to protect from synchronous access, uh, from, sorry, from concurrent access. Like, uh, and in that case, you could set up a Go routine that manages that, that structure and send it instructions via channels to update or retrieve values from that, from that data structure. But often, um, it's actually easier to just create a lock for that data structure and do it in the, in the typical way. But um, Go sort of gives you the freedom to, to either use channels where they're appropriate or use locks where they're appropriate. Um, there's no sort of uh, prescriptiveness there in the language. So the question was, you can send channels via channels. And what's the practical application of this? So a common application of this is um, you, if you ha uh, it's a pattern where you have some kind of multiplexer that, say, receives messages on a channel and then wants to send it out over a variety of channels or a range of channels to various Go routines. And um, in, in that situation, if a Go routine wants to be included in that multiplexer, it will actually send a channel to the multiplexer and the multiplex will add it to its list of channels it should be sending things to. So in that way, you can kind of register with some Go routine and then be associated with it. And um, another one is uh, you can create a data structure that includes a function value and a channel, send it to some, func to some other Go routine which executes the function and then sends the result of that function call back down the channel to the caller. So it's, it's kind of, I always kind of envision it as like you sort of coil up a rope and like throw the other end to somebody um, actually down a channel and then they, they pass things back to you that way. So it, there's some really cool things that you can do once you sort of start getting into the details of it. It's a good question. Anybody else? No? Yeah? The question was, what's the preferred text editor for writing Go? Um, the answer is that we're decidedly agnostic on this front. Um, I use Vim. I know some of the other guys on the team use some more esoteric editors. We have Emacs users. Um, there are people who use Eclipse. People use Xcode. Um, in the Go 
distribution, there is a MISC folder which has editor support for a variety of editors. Um, and we're always keen to have people submit uh, support for other editors as well. I know for Eclipse there is actually a project called Go Clips, which extends the support um, for writing Go and Eclipse further. But I'm not an Eclipse user, so I don't know a hell of a lot about that. But so the, the statement was, does, doesn't that make that hard for um, debugging things if you can't step through things? Well, we don't. We don't have um, really. Uh, solid IDE integration in terms of debugging. But in the last few months, we've really improved our support for GDB, the GNU debugger. Um, and if you have an editor that's GDB aware, then that should be able to interact pretty well. Um, with, that should be able to debug Go programs pretty well. Um, but this is definitely something that we are looking to improve even further. And um, sort of on the roadmap is a a dedicated Go debugger that we would endeavor to integrate with as many environments as we could. Yeah? What was your background prior to Go? Uh, my background was uh, in applications programming and systems programming. I used to work for a web startup before I started at Google um, in which I wrote a lot of a variety of code from front end to back end to uh, we did a large um, data mining system. And before that, I worked for internet providers building applications for them. Anybody else? No? Who's coming to my workshop this afternoon? Hey, Victory. Great. I'll see you all there. Thank you. <laughs>